This is Book TV's Afterwards podcast. This week, Catherine Flowers, founder of the Center for Rural Enterprise and Environmental Justice, reflects on her efforts to improve water and sanitary conditions in rural areas across America. She's interviewed by Grist Senior Editor Nikhil Swaminathan. Catherine Flowers, uh, first thing I'd like to say is a huge congratulations on your MacArthur grant announced pretty recently. Um, and thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, it's an amazing accomplishment, and uh, it's come out uh, around the same time as this book, uh, which we're going to discuss today. Um, just curious, you know, you've been working in Lowndes County now um, for 20 years or so. And what made now the right time for this book? Um, and, and what made you want to write it? Well, it's, this is very interesting. I, I've always wanted to write a book. Um, those people that have known me for a very long time know that I've been talking about writing since I was in high school. But uh, this book, it just felt right for me to do it. Actually, I started writing it last year mm-hmm. uh, and, and had no idea of the, the events that were going to happen in 2020. But uh, I felt like 2020 was the year that this book needed to be, you know, needed to be out there. And I had no idea that, that the historical uh, gods would be in my favor uh, in terms of making it more receptive to, to audiences than it may have been had it been at another time. Mm-hmm. So uh, I just felt that it was time to, to write it and tell the story. And what was the, what's the key message you wanted to convey and who's the key audience that you had in mind as you were writing? Well, I had the option of either writing an academic book mm-hmm. or a book that can reach the mass audience. I wanted to reach the mass audience. Mm-hmm. And I tried to write it in such a way in which, you know, coming from my country girl perspective, in a way that it could communicate with everyone mm-hmm. and that everyone could see themselves in it and that no matter where you're from, whether you're from a rural community in Lowndes County, Alabama, or New York City, that mm-hmm. you can make a difference. That's really an important message. And, and much of the book takes place in Lowndes County, Alabama, which I believe you live in currently. Um, and I'm curious, can you speak a little bit about the region, which you've, you've known for decades? And, mm-hmm. and of course, your, your, your specific connection to it. Well, Lowndes County is located between Selma and Montgomery. It is um, about 714 square miles. It's a very rural county. Uh, It has six small towns, the largest being the town of Fort Deposit, which is in the southern part of of Lowndes County. Um, The major interstate highway that goes through there is Interstate 65 going north and south, which you're going to Mobile or to the to the Gulf, you you probably go through Lowndes County if you're on 65. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other famous road that most people know about is the Selma to Montgomery March route, which most of which goes through Lowndes County. Uh, in addition, you know, Lowndes County's history is very much tied to slavery. You know, I'm, I'm associated with the Equal Justice Initiative mm-hmm. and EJI has recorded uh, racial lynchings in Lowndes County, at least nine. Uh, there are probably even more, mo- most of which were probably not documented. Mm-hmm. But uh, Montgomery, at the end of when they ended the domestic slave, the international slave trade, Montgomery became one of the hubs for the domestic slave trade. And people would be brought in uh, by rail or by river to Montgomery and then auction off at the square. And a lot of those people, uh, which I'm descendants of, uh, ended up in Lowndes County. Uh, and the interesting part about this history is that I'm learning more recently, uh, I'm starting to hear from some people that were actually descended from the slave owners who have reached out as well. And, and I believe that, um, that the history of the region makes it so compelling and make the story even more compelling right now at this particular mm-hmm. time. And, you know, you mentioned um, earlier about the importance of the year 2020 and how the events of 2020 um, 
served as a back as more of a backdrop for the book. Um, and so I'm curious, what's the, what's the situation in Lowndes County related to COVID-19 and, um, the racial protests that we saw, um, throughout the summer, you know, it's been a really, um, remarkable year, um, in good ways and bad. Um, and I'm just curious, like, how has Lowndes County weathered that? Well, in terms of um, in terms of COVID nineteen, Lowndes County has had the highest per capita death and infection rate in the state of Alabama, mm-hmm. uh, and there have been lots of people that have passed on, and in some cases, it struck more than one immediate family member uh, because of the, the intersections of poverty, people living in small homes or small mobile homes where they cannot socially isolate or people that were able, that had to go to work and they're working uh, on so-called essential low paying jobs because they have to support their families Mm -hmm. and they got sick at work and brought it home. So there, it's been a a really um, intense uh, impact on Lowndes County. In terms of Lowndes County's history of of racial justice, um, I think it's timely that the story you know, emits from Lowndes County right now because Lowndes County at one point, um, because of the terror, the racial terror that existed, mm-hmm. uh, it was significant that during the voting rights movement, which is also still significant to this year, that Lowndes County organized the Lowndes County Freedom Organization. These were former sharecroppers who were kicked off the property when they registered to vote. And and the Lowndes County Freedom Organization took as its emblem of the Black Panther and the Black Panther people associated with the Black Panther Party in Oakland, but it actually started in Lowndes County. Mm-hmm. So all of these, I think the Lowndes County became the perfect place for this to emanate from simply because of what has happened prior to 2020. But 2020 uh, has shown us all of these disparities and has magnified it in such a way with COVID that it can no longer be ignored. And I think the book may have had a different reception had it not been for George Floyd murder, which I, you know, never should have happened or what happened to Breonna Taylor never should have happened. And likewise, COVID should not have had this impact on the communities that are most vulnerable, but it now puts us in a position where we have to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And there's a early, you know, the roots of a lot of this, um, you, you had sort of, a uh, an early view of that when you moved to Lowndes County in 1968 and you you write about your parents, um, and the people who would come by your house and ask for advice and, um, members of the civil rights movement that, uh, you, you sort of were, were in your orbit, even when you were young. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? I know you mentioned the Black Panthers, uh, starting from uh, Lowndes County, but yeah, could you could you tell us a little bit more about that early history? Yes, uh, I call my parents the jailhouse lawyers of their community <laughs> because everybody would come by our house at some point or the other um, and basically uh, give advice. Just to give you just a little bit of background about my parents, my father was a Korean era veteran. Mm-hmm. Uh, my brother and I were discussing him the other day and we talked about the fact that You know, he talked, my father always talked about his time in the military, and he went in the military shortly after the end of of World War II. So he was impacted by what he saw in Germany. Mm -hmm. And that had a lot to do with um, his value for the the U.S. Constitution. And as a result, he said that he spent five years, four months, and 17 days in the military, and he was going to enjoy every b- privilege and benefit that went along with defending the U.S. Constitution and fighting <laughs> tyranny abroad. So he flew a flag every day. He had, we had a flag in front of our house, and my brother and I said, you know, he was a real patriot. I don't know, some people are calling themselves patriots today, but he was a patriot supporting the Constitution and felt that everybody should have had access to those rights, no matter who they were, and fought for them. So as a result of his uh, zeal for that, a lot of people would come to our home. And my mother was an organizer. Uh, she was more of a 
She was a quieter person, but was very, very uh, welcoming. And and anyone that came to our home, not only did she talk to them, but she fed them too. <laughs> so we had a lot of people who would come through. And just to give you an example, one of the persons that I met uh, is Willie Ricks, who's still alive. And Willie Ricks, um, uh, people know him now as Mukasa, but Willie Ricks was actually the first person to say black power. And he was, um, he was to Stokely Carmichael, probably to similar to Rafa Abernathy, who he was to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Mm -hmm. So uh, I met him when I was very young and we continue to, to stay in touch to this day. Um, there was another household that was very influential and that was the Jackson household. The Jackson family were the family, were the, the family that actually gave the members of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, a place to stay where the SNCC house was located mm -hmm. uh, on their property. And whenever people would come to town, be they activists or whomever, they would always make it to the Jacksons' house. And the Jacksons would invite my parents to come and they would take me. So I had the opportunity to, to meet all these people, having have no idea at the time exactly the impact they were having on my life but I realized that it was very, very significant. And um, it, it seems like the first um, instance on, on the path to where you are now, um, where, where you sort of started to show um, the, the, the activist route had taken hold um, was you wrote an article for a newsletter about the Lowndes County Training School where you attended high school. And um, you credit that piece with changing your life. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the article and, and, and what you set out to document? Well, I had, <laughs> well, I, I, was, I had been invited to be a part of a, um, uh, a local weekly television show called Focus. And the host was is now a city council person here in Montgomery, but his name was Tracy. Name is Tracy Larkin, and on the show um, I was invited because I wrote poetry. I thought <laughs> so. I thought that's why I was invited. But anyway, I, I was there and I recited my poetry, and he started asking questions about my school. I didn't know that my school's reputation was far and wide, a bad reputation, in fact. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was someone who was in the audience. Um, her name was Penny Weaver, mm -hmm. uh, who went on to become one of the founders of the Southern Poverty Law Center, uh, approached me and asked me would I write an article uh, for a newsletter she was doing about my school. And I wrote the article and I talked about the fact that uh, I wanted a quality education and how the, the, the principal has shown the Mac, uh, which is a movie about pimping doing school hours and charged us to go and see it. Of course, students wanted to see it because the movie was a movie we could not have seen uh, in Montgomery at the theaters without a, a parent being present at the time because mm -hmm. of its rating. It was at least an R rating. Mm -hmm. So we were, and, and from that, uh, we got a call from the two uh, organizers with uh, the American Free and Service Committee in Montgomery and they asked to come and see me. They called my parents and asked to come to see me and asked me about, they started telling me about my school and the mm -hmm. violations that they saw in that article and gave me a copy of this Alabama code about education and asked me to read it. And then I taught me how to document every violation that I saw at my school. And that wow. began my active career. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Active is learning how to change things. Mm -hmm. And then you carried that right into college um, with your work for um, Alabama State University. And um, it was in a interesting spot where they were looking to merge it with a couple other schools and, and you became active in the effort to um, help it retain, retain its identity. Um, and I'm curious, I, I would love to, to hear more about your relationship to that particular school because it seems like you, you went there initially and then left and came back and it, it seems to have been an important place, much like Lowndes County itself, where, where you would 
leave, but then find yourself coming back? Well, Alabama State University has a very rich history in this area and a very rich history of activism. You know, a mm-hmm. lot of people that were involved in the um, in the, the 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 modern day civil rights movement mm-hmm. emanated from Alabama State University mm-hmm. uh, and attended Alabama State University. Some of them were quite active. Alabama State University professors and students were quite active in the Montgomery bus boycott. Mm-hmm. Uh, Actually, the flyers that were distributed to support it were actually printed there at Alabama State University. Um, so I, Alabama State University was so important to me because some of the professors there had a profound influence on my life. And that's where I was really introduced to African-American history. Dr. Norman Walton was my professor there. And, you know, I became a history major. Mm-hmm. Um, largely because of that, and I, I, that's when I was introduced to John Hope Franklin and read his, you know, From Slavery to Freedom, which I still have a copy of because mm-hmm. of Alabama State University. So when there was an effort to, um, to merge the university, uh, I, I sprung to action. I didn't think about it. Uh, I didn't think about it, but I had influential pe- people in my life like uh, Joe Reed. Uh, mm-hmm. Joe Reed's son is now the the first was just elected the first black mayor of Montgomery, but he talked about a lot of the things as it relates to the history, but he also helped me to understand the the policy part of it, which I didn't understand as a student that time. Mm -hmm. All I knew was my role as an activist. So what I did, I organized a march to save Alabama State University. Uh, I pulled together a group of my friends, initially and we started organizing. I think I was sick at the time when I came up with it because I was in the hospital. That was, that was where we had our first meeting mm-hmm. at St. Jude, which is where I was in the hospital at the time. Mm-hmm. From there, we pulled together a group of students and more people got involved. Uh, and that march uh, included a young man uh, named Randy Anderson, mm-hmm. uh, who was a vet who had returned to Montgomery. Uh, his father was a former Tuskegee Airman. And we, we pulled together students and had the largest march that they had had in Montgomery since the days of the civil rights movement. And we also organized not only students from Alabama State University, but we went around the state and organized students from other HBCUs who showed up. It was like very momentous. And for me, it was rewarding as a young person to see those many people come together to try to save this legacy. That's amazing. and. Um... Through that, you met um, people like Dr. Joseph Lowry and uh, James Orange. I happen to live in Atlanta, about a mile and a half away from the Martin Luther King, um, you know, birthplace and uh, museum. Uh, And these people are legends here. And so to walk amongst them when you're a relatively young adult, how did that influence you in your work now? Oh, wow. The way it influences me in my work now is to be able to pass on what I have to young people. I mean, Mm -hmm. if you know anything about James Orange, he called everybody leader, you know, and Mm -hmm. he was a big leader, but everybody was a leader. So I think from them and for Dr. Lowry, uh, and his staff and E. Randall Osborne and all those folks that take me under their wing when I was very, very young uh, was was outstanding because I actually met James Orange in Selma. I had no idea who he was. <laughs> First met him. Uh, I was with um, a gentleman named uh, Leon Hall. I was sitting with Leon at the time mm-hmm. and and James was sitting at a table nearby because they were there for the Maggie Bozeman, Julia Wilder voting rights march. And uh, James and I became friends and stayed in contact through the years. And, but I had all, all I had met Dr. Lowry prior to that time because of the work that I was doing at Alabama State University because SCLC supported us. We actually established an SCLC chapter. We had a charter to establish a chapter there at Alabama State University. Mm-hmm. So to be around these folk, I had no idea they were bigger than life. You know, it was only in more recent times that I realized that James Orange was very, very instrumental. What happened to him was instrumental in the actual Selma to Montgomery March. He never mm-hmm. talked about that. He was very humble. Every time he saw me anywhere, 
he would, I remember once I saw him in Washington, this is for one of the marches on Washington, uh, one of the anniversaries. And he was standing behind this area that they had blocked off for the dignitaries. And he saw mm-hmm. him, he said, come here, baby sister. That's what he always called me. <laughs> and brought me back there where everybody was. I mean, he was always that kind of person. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and Reverend Lowry was probably one of the reasons why I spoke English a little bit better than I did before, because he was always correcting me. <laughs> so, but I, I, I just, I, I, I think I've gotten to the age now where I can look back and reflect and realize, oh, wow, these were like Forrest Gump moments. And (laughs) (laughs) I did not know that these people would be such giants in history, but I feel very fortunate to have been among, you know, be around them and to have learned from them. Yeah. And it seems like when you left college and became a teacher, those types of connections and ability to to expose students to um, leaders and people who are out in the world and making change seemed really important to you. I, I was really struck by the you know the experiences you tried to you 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 went through great pains to put through for your students to uh, put together for your students, you know, taking uh, middle schoolers from DC to the 25th anniversary of the Selma to Montgomery March or students from North Carolina to Bill Clinton's inauguration. I'm just curious, you know, what, when you were, when you were thinking about that as an educator, um, what was, what, what was driving you to create those, those moments for these students? I wanted them to see history in action. Mm. You know, I think that with young people, sometimes it's hard for them to, you know, we talk about the other things that happen that they need to know about American history, Mm. but to actually see how activism can make a difference, Mm -hmm. to actually see people, uh, if if we were talking about the constitution and it's freedom of speech, to actually go and see the impact of it, but also to be around people that, could have an influence on, on them. When we went to the 25th anniversary of the Selma to Montgomery March, we actually had a chance to meet a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And because we had a school, we had a bus that mm-hmm. took our students there, um, a charter bus, we, there were people, the older people that were on the march, we would let them get on our bus while our students were marching because it was cooler. Um, and, and a lot of them just couldn't couldn't make that walk again. Mm-hmm. So one of the persons that they met was a woman named Annie Cooper. Mm-hmm. Annie Cooper, if anybody saw the, the movie Selma, mm-hmm. uh, Oprah Winfrey played Annie Cooper in the movie. But this, Annie Cooper had shared with them her story and the children became so, you know, they, they became so in love with her, they started calling her grandma. And some of them continued to write her even afterwards, but we did, never knew the historical figure that she was. Mm-hmm. So I just felt it was very important for my students to have the opportunity to go to Selma, to, to, to meet people there. Uh, their assignment on that trip was to meet someone who participated in the original march and write, a, write an essay about them. Mm-hmm. And, and, and they did that. And, and and now a lot of those students are now in their 40s and they reach out to me. I remember one student uh, reached out to me and told me that when Obama ran for president, he went and, and volunteered and worked in his office, mm-hmm. his campaign office. He said, and the reason why I did that is because I thought about Selma. And this was a student that I had taken there when he was in the eighth grade. Mm-hmm. So oftentimes when we plant these lessons, plant these seeds, uh, that's the only, you know, we don't know until years later the impact. Now, regarding the election, I mm-hmm. felt it was very important for them because when to go to the Clinton inauguration, I had promised, actually, I had interviewed at that school prior to the election. And one of the things I said to the principal, no matter who wins, there were three people running that year. It was Ross Perot, Bill Clinton, and, and Bush. And no matter who won that year, that I was going to take the students to the inauguration. And I felt that it was an opportunity for them to learn what the electoral college was and how it worked. And it was also an opportunity for them to see the whole, the process in terms of the transition. Mm-hmm. And it, you know, Bill Clinton 
one. And, um, you know, I wrote in the book that the way I even got <laughs> to go was that I went to Washington during my Christmas break and volunteered <laughs> at their at their uh, inauguration headquarters. It was at the Navy Yard. Mm -hmm. And I volunteered there and got the opportunity. I, I was invited to come back as a hostess mm -hmm. uh, for, the, for the, the Arkansas Ball, which was the coveted <laughs> ticket that year. Mm -hmm. But it also gave me access to information about everything else. And I was able to organize the trip, raise the money, and take my students. And um, there's, there's a lot. It's interesting, the book. Um, as I was reading it, felt like it had two specific sections. One where, you know, you were sort of coming of age and going through a series of formative experiences and actually really traveling and, and living extensively throughout, you know, the eastern half of the U.S. Um, and, and I guess also in Oklahoma. Um, and it was it was a very personal journey for the first half of it. And we learn about, you know, your parents and we learn about your husband and the accident that he suffered and then your advocacy for him. Um, and then when we get to the year 2000, um, shortly after your dad passes, uh, you're still the vehicle for the story, but it becomes much, much more about Lowndes County and the people who live there. And, you know, we don't hear again about your husband Thurgood and we don't hear very much about your daughter Taylor. Um, was that a conscious decision? Did you, did you see yourself switching from, you know, the making of Catherine Flowers to your work at in Lowndes County as you were writing? <laughs> well, I, I I think that I wrote it to, to, to help people to understand how I got to that point. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I felt it was important to tell that part of the story. I just started off as a normal person <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and things just evolved. It, it was almost like serendipity, um, mm -hmm. the way things happen. And I was still a mom. Uh, by that time, Thurgood and I were divorced, mm -hmm. but the story shifted because my my activism kind of took off mm -hmm. uh, because of Lowndes County. To me, it's like a family member too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but it was a family member that has always been there because of the love that I have for the county that my father instilled uh, in me, and I have so many relatives in Lowndes County because we, you know, that's where a lot of family is. Mm -hmm. um, so that was. Um, uh, I just thought it was just so important to, for people to see that my evolution took mm -hmm. me back to where I started. And, and there's so many, there's a, there's a few little nuggets in the book where you mentioned the, the book, Jonathan Livingston Seagull, and um, how that, that struck you personally. You mentioned at some point quietly wanting to be an astronaut and you, 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 you note that you had this adventurer within you and yet your story came full circle back to sort of where you were um, as a young person. And I'm curious how, because it's become extremely focused, right? In the last 20 years. And I, I'm just curious how that's, how that, how that whole sort of arc went for you. <laughs> Well, I still have a love for NASA and, and space travel, and <laughs> hopefully one day I'll get a chance to have that experience. Um, but I think that the, the evolution itself was, was, was a natural one to happen because of all the other events that were, you know, that I had no control of. I just happened to be in the place in the space at the time and have the opportunity to uh, take everything that I've learned and apply it to help deal with that problem. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it was, um, uh, in terms of my, my lust for adventure, I still have that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, still have that very much. It, but uh, the activism part is more of a heartfelt thing. It's, <laughs> it's the, 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 um, the things that I have gravitated toward, I believe, mm -hmm. have been uh, 
I guess in Lowndes County, it was more or less because I'm from Lowndes County. Uh, I had the opportunity and privilege to live other places. And when I went back and I saw that things had not changed that much. Mm -hmm. And I also still had relationships that I still have, you know, mm -hmm. the relationships that I've had since a child that um, pretty much gave me the information that I needed to connect with my activism to try to bring about the change that needed to happen. Because in Lowndes County, I learned how to listen. Mm -hmm. uh, and listening is, is a very, very key part to activism because a lot of people don't listen and they go in with what they think are the answers mm -hmm. and they haven't talked to the local folk <laughs> yeah. uh, or spent the kind of time they need to, to, to be able to understand the dynamics of what's really going on uh, instead of what they've been told by politicians who may write a narrative that's more glowing than it really is for the residents. Mm -hmm. So um, that that arc uh, that brought me back there and, and, and got me connected with um, uh, the fight mm -hmm. <laughs> for sanitation justice mm -hmm. uh, just naturally evolved. I could not have predicted that. I mean, yeah. I, I did not predict that. I didn't think that I would be dealing with waste which in particular, I never thought that, uh, but here we are. <laughs> and you, yeah, you came back to be an economic development consultant, correct? Yes. And um, later in the book, uh, you tell a story about um, Senator Elizabeth Warren's sort of diagnosis of what was going on in Lowndes County. And it seemed to parallel your re early rearrival there in terms of being able to sum up why this area wasn't really um, finding new businesses to come in. And then as you're working on economic development issues, you start to realize like the literal depths of the sanitation issue there. And I'm, I'm just curious, like, can you explain that sort of awakening where you come to solve one problem and then you realize that there are so much, so many more underlying issues related to poverty and race and just, you know, normal human dignity. Um, well, when I was, one of the things that I found out being the economic development coordinator, first of all, it was very, very hard because mm -hmm. there were some people that have preconceived notions about Lowndes County who were in government or who had access to these funds. And they were using implicit bias mm -hmm. when it came to determining. I mean, I didn't know to call it implicit bias then, but I've come to understand that's what it was mm -hmm. in terms of deciding who should get access to funding and who shouldn't. And that mm -hmm. still exists today because the business community can get access to funding or they try to wrap it in that package and give it to them. They can get the, the economic welfare from the government, but when it comes to residents, they're left to their own devices and that's a failed paradigm. Mm -hmm. And what I had been told um, initially, what I thought uh, and what a lot of people believe that, well, if you have businesses come into the area, it's going to bring jobs and then the community is going to thrive and that'll lift them up out of poverty. Mm -hmm. But it does not happen when we don't unpeel and undo the systemic racism that has created these situations in the first place. Mm -hmm. The reason that these situations were created in places like Lowndes County was to keep the labor cheap because they were used to having free labor doing slavery. And it has manifested and evolved in so many different ways over the years. So they can still get cheap labor. Mm -hmm. That's what they want since they have to pay for it. They want cheap labor. So people are kept poor. They are not, they are denied access to infrastructure that could bring other kinds of jobs in that could, could uh, raise the standard of living and also to raise the, um, uh, to raise the, the kind of uh, the monies that the people could have to be able to buy other things, to buy better homes, to buy, you know, to pay for education for their children, to put money into the school system. All of that is part of a successful paradigm. But I think mm -hmm. that, that the conflict that I had at that time, and I love Elizabeth Warren, mm -hmm. uh, Elizabeth Warren um, the, the, the conflict at that time was that 
she was espousing the same thing that I had espoused earlier, but I saw that it didn't work. Mm -hmm. And that in communities of color, and particularly in environmental justice communities, uh, economic development means to the elected officials usually is bringing in dirty plants, landfills, um, uh, petrochemical plants, and other kinds of plants that were poisoning the environment, and of course, poisoning the people too, mm -hmm. who are already suffering from healthcare disparities. Mm -hmm. so it's it's a, it's a paradigm of of destruction where they think it's okay to sacrifice these communities, and and that's one of the things that we have to change. And hopefully, out of you know, people can see that in the book is how. And that's one reason why I told the story that way, because we have to unpack these layers to see mm -hmm. that this just didn't get that way. Some yeah. of it was intentional. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you mentioned you love Elizabeth Warren. She's obviously an ally in your work now. Um, perhaps more surprising to readers might be an ally that you had uh, early on when you were back in Alabama, uh, the former attorney general. Attorney General Jeff Sessions, um, and also you had worked um, closely with Bob Woodson, who I believe was also a MacArthur Grant recipient, uh, but is a conservative. Uh, and I'm I'm just curious, you know, they were very unlikely characters as I was, you know, reading the book, and I think everybody who's watching this program probably has a good good idea of who Jeff Sessions is and maybe less so about um, Mr. Woodson. So if you could tell us a little bit about him, but also what it was like to work with people whose political beliefs maybe didn't really square with yours, but who you were able to find some, you know, sort of collaborative common goals with. Well, you know, growing up in a community uh, or in a state that's now very red, mm -hmm. it's been very red for a long time. <laughs> so uh, I've learned how to navigate in in this situation. Mm -hmm. And with uh, with Mr. Woodson, I met Mr. Woodson after uh, Bush was elected president, and I was invited to a faith based summit because of a young man named Elroy Saylor that I had met in Detroit. And Elroy was working for J.C. Watts at the time. And J.C. is actually from a community that's very similar to Lowndes County and you follow Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. So I was invited to the Faith-Based Summit and I went. Um, and at the summit, Mr. Woodson spoke and something he said spoke to me. And I had seen him on television when they were trying to decide who the president was. And he was speaking on behalf of the Bush campaign. So I went, I saw him um, leave the stage and I followed him and I asked, and I started talking to him and I asked him, would he come to Lowndes County to help me? And I told him what I was trying to do because I had met him before. Mm -hmm. I had met him at a 21st century leadership camp at Stillman College. When mm -hmm. I was still a teacher, I took my students there and we got into uh, a heated exchange because I could not accept the fact that he was a conservative. <laughs> the time. It's so interesting how I evolved to be able to accept him for who he was. Uh, but he he readily agreed to help us. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I found out that he was very, very good at working in neighborhoods and helping um, formerly and, and, and currently incarcerated young people. Actually, a lot of the work that Bob Wilson does, a lot of people don't know about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and how significant he is to a lot of these communities in, in terms of helping young men who have been a victim of the system be able to overcome that. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I was um, pleasantly surprised when I found that out. But when he came to Lowndes County the first time and he saw the raw sewage issue, he immediately sprung into action to help us. And a lot of people that he brought with us, a lot of his friends were actually Democrats. Mm -hmm. One of them, one of his best friends calls himself a yellow dog Democrat. <laughs> so, so that was, I think, through the relationship with Bob Wilson, I learned about, you know, bipartisanship and how people can be friends. And sometimes we, we have assumptions that people of different political belief systems don't talk to each other. I mean, that's not most of us. That's, that's a rare, uh, that's a rare group of people that are like that, I believe. Mm -hmm. However, with Jeff Sessions, um, the way I met Senator Sessions, they have town hall meetings 
uh, in Lowndes County and probably throughout the state where the senators, when they come back and they meet with local constituents to tell them what they're doing in Washington. And this particular town hall meeting was in uh, Fort Deposit. Mm -hmm. I went there and he talked about these grant programs that were available to help with some of the issues. And I raised my hand, I asked the question, well, how do poor communities get access to this grant, especially poor communities with no tax base? Mm -hmm. And he really couldn't answer the question, but surprisingly he came to me at the, afterwards and, and, and we talked and he said that, um, I've always been interested and concerned about that. And I don't know how to, to do that. How do we deal with that? And, um, and that's how we started. And he told me that he was from originally from Wilcox County, Alabama, which is also in the black belt. Mm -hmm. And he told me, he said, you know, my family didn't have a television in the house until they would till I was 10. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, share, share the experience of poverty and rural poverty in particular, which a lot of people don't talk about. You know, I think we need to talk about that more, even though some of us have, quote, made it, then mm -hmm. we talk about the fact that we have that shared experience. Um, but that was how Jeff Sessions and I connected. And then mm -hmm. at that point, um, whenever we had meetings, he would send a representative to be there because during that time I started getting death threats. Oh um, somebody put a ball python in my apartment. So uh, Senator Sessions would send people, send people to be with me when I would go places. And I felt it provided me with a degree of security that in a very red state mm -hmm. that I would not have had, had Senator Sessions aide not been with me at the meeting or mm -hmm. Or they had to take me seriously in a way in which they wouldn't have before, because how many U.S. senators do that? Uh, so that was my first experience in, in working with him. And we continued to have a friendship even afterwards uh, for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that part of the connection was that Sessions is also from the Black Belt. So I want to take a little bit of a turn towards some science that was, you know, part of the part of the story. And first I want to, I want you to just sort of explain for viewers what it means to be part of Alabama's black belt and how that relates to the sanitation issue specifically. Well, Alabama's black belt um, is consists of primarily of about 17 counties, give or mm -hmm. take. And the soils here are, most of them have a heavy clay consistency and mm -hmm. they hold water. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just one part of the story. I think the other part of the story that people are not telling us relates to climate change is that we also have high water tables in a lot of these areas, mm -hmm. which are getting higher as, as we deal with sea level rise. Uh, but it's very hard for a conventional septic system to work there. Mm -hmm. And when these conventional septic systems fail, uh, they, they tend to either have sewage on top of the ground or it brings the sewage back into the homes, especially when the ground is saturated with water. Mm -hmm. So, but the region is also uh, heavily populated by descendants of slaves uh, and, and heavily a uh, region populated by African-Americans. Mm -hmm. So, and a lot of them do not have the wastewater infrastructure in place. There's not been the type of investment. Actually one time, uh, you know, the, 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 the department, um, the cabinet level department that's responsible for rural sanitation and rural housing comes on the USDA. Yeah. I remember uh, the other U.S. Senator from Alabama telling me once, uh, Catherine, find out why Alabama keeps sending money back to Washington for USDA. Mm -hmm. So even the funding that at one point they came here to that was supposed to help families in the black belt, mm -hmm. they were sending it back mm -hmm. instead of making sure that there was infrastructure in place uh, that we could use instead of the, the when they did put it, what they do put infrastructure in place is usually the cheapest infrastructure usually fails. And then the narrative becomes, oh, well, the people don't know how to manage it, but they're selling them the cheapest most unreliable infrastructure that there is, and then blaming it on the people when they would not put the, the same infrastructure in more affluent communities. And that's part of this, um, what you call an economy that had evolved to prey on impoverished citizens in Lowndes County, correct? 
Yes. Um, so what you did, what a lot of what you've done over the last 15 to 20 years is take various visitors, um, U.S. senators, journalists, U.N. special rapporteurs, um, a whole host of people to see how people live in Lowndes County. And um, in 2009, you went to see a woman named Char. And I wonder if you'll tell us about uh, what happened when you visited her property and what that led to, because it led to a very stunning discovery eight years later. Yes. Um, well, I had actually gotten a call from the person, uh, from, a, from one of the regional environmentalists for, uh, for the state health department. And he called me and told me that there was a young woman uh, who was in her twenties and pregnant and they were threatening her with arrest because she didn't have a septic system. Uh, what I did know when I went there is that her family had had somehow scraped together, I think it was like $800 to, for a perk test to keep her out of jail. Um, so before going there, I called the Associated Press and I took a journalist with me because I, I, I had learned, as Mr. Wilson said, sometimes you have to shed light on situations for it to be radioactive to keep things from happening. Mm -hmm. And in this case, I felt like I needed to have that witness. And we went there um, and we met the, this same person that had called me along with the person who was a county environmentalist at the time. And we went into her home and she explained to us, she had one child who was autistic and she was pregnant with another one. Uh, she was only getting disability. She didn't have a disability for a child and she didn't have a, a big income. Mm -hmm where she could have put in a septic system. And the property that she lived on was her mother's property. And it was uh, more than a few acres. So there was nobody close by. I was wondering who reported. They probably smelled it, but they weren't that close. Nobody lived that close to them. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I asked to see, you know, where the area was and because we were inside of her home. So we went outside. She was in a single wide mobile home. Mm -hmm. We walked around to the side. It was during the month of October which uh, it was still very warm then. And, and there was a pit right outside her back door. Um, someone had dug a pit where the sewage would come from the house because with a mobile home, it comes with the plumbing and all they do is get PVC pipe. Then they straight pipe their fluent out. So when they flush the toilet, it'll go outside the home. In this case, it was right outside her back door. Uh -huh. And it was teeming with mosquitoes. Uh -huh. I had on a dress and dress and stockings, but those mosquitoes bit me through my stockings. I mean, they, I had so many bites on my legs at, at the time. And, and I didn't think about it right away until I, my body started breaking out in a rash. Mm -hmm. Places where I didn't have bites, I started breaking out in a rash. And I, uh, I went to my doctor, who's actually a nurse practitioner. Mm -hmm. I went to her and I, and I told her what happened. I said, look, I was around this raw sewage. It was had um, mosquitoes on it and these mosquitoes bit me. Um, and I, I've broken out. I want you to test my blood and make sure I didn't don't have anything because, you know, I know with blood being involved and it was on feces, you know, what could potentially be wrong with me. So the, all the test results came back negative. Mm -hmm. And when the test results came back negative, I asked her, is it possible that I could have something that American doctors are not trained to, to look for? Mm -hmm. Because these are not issues that you expect to find in the United States. We don't even acknowledge that we have this problem. Right. And she said, yes. <laughs> so later I saw an op-ed that was written in the New York Times by Dr. Peter Hotez, mm -hmm. who has now become kind of one of the spokespersons about COVID because right. he, he's an infectious disease specialist and he's also a creator of vaccines. Mm -hmm. And um, he wrote about tropical diseases being it out on our shores. Mm -hmm. And I saw in this op-ed, he mentioned wastewater. Yeah. So I Googled him, <laughs> found an email address, emailed him. He emailed me right in and, and told him about what I was seeing in Lyons County, about my own experience. Um, 
he emailed me right away. And he was going to be in Atlanta for a conference the next week. And we met at that conference Mm -hmm. and we talked and he said, I'm going to send my parasitologist there because we're going to look for hookworm. Mm -hmm. And he, one of the things he told me, he said, Catherine, these are neglected diseases of poverty. Mm -hmm. He said, anywhere you find poverty in the world, you're going to find these diseases. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, that's how we ended up doing the parasite study, uh, which we were, we collected fecal soil, water, and blood samples from people throughout Lowndes County. And we were able to, um, they, they, in their lab in Houston, mm-hmm. they were able to find evidence of hookworm and other tropical parasites. How shocked were you when that result came back? Because I think it was a third of the people tested or more. I was shocked that it was so many, but I wasn't shocked at the finding. Mm-hmm. I wasn't shocked at the finding because people had been complaining about uh, illnesses. Mm-hmm. And I, one of the things that I noticed, uh, I went to, I had gone um, to, to Lyons County accompanying some, um, some of our partners with Partners in Health. Mm-hmm. Uh, the organization was founded by Paul Farmer. And when we went there and, 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 and some staff members from EJI, and when we went to visit some of the folk, Every, but everywhere we went, people were sick. Mm-hmm. And and they were in my age group. And I remember one of the persons on the trip saying, Catherine, they look so much older, but it was because they were sick. Mm-hmm. And I was trying to figure out why are so many people sick? Why are so many people, you know, diabetics? Why are so many people? I mean, it seems like when illness take place, take hold of folk is worse. Yeah. And I couldn't figure out why. So this result helped me to understand part of it and why there was so much asthma. A lot of people have respiratory uh, illnesses. So there's probably more that we simply haven't looked for yet. And towards the end of the book, you say that a few years ago, you would have identified yourself as an environmental justice activist. But I'm curious what you would identify yourself as now, because um, we're coming to the end of the interview. So I want to just just ask, like, you've gone through this amazing, you know, last 20 years of work and, and you've done so many things to call attention to what's going on in Lowndes County. What, what, what has that turned you into, I guess, if not an environmental justice activist? I am a teacher activist. I'm still, a, I, I've, I've always described teaching as being, as activism in a different way. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I think my role now is to, to pass on what I've learned, the knowledge that I've learned, because I do believe in, in transitioning and, and transformational leadership. And that is making sure that young people don't have to start at where I started at, that they can take it to the next level. Mm-hmm. Um, that's I mean, it, it's it's amazing how all of your formative experiences from the first half of the book, just like you can see how each one left you with a tool that was used in the second half of the book. So uh, I, I think that that part about how you um, lay everything out is really clear and and, and impressive. Um, the one sentence, that really stuck with me. Um, and I'll, I'll make this my final question, but the one sentence that um, really stuck out with me came from the first chapter of the book. Um, and it was four words long. Meanwhile, poor people wait. And, um, you know, the theme comes back throughout the book, uh, you know, a federal civil rights case about the conditions in Lowndes County uh, that hasn't hadn't been responded to by February 2020. Um, you know, eight years waiting for an EPA grant to come through, even the time that it takes to do the hookworm study. Um, and I'm just curious, like those four words, like in a in a in a matter of speaking, could sum up a lot of what's in the book. So I'm curious, like how those four words make you feel. 
Well, I, I, it's, it's a testament to what we have to do to solve these problems. I think the reason that people wait is because some people get frustrated and stop fighting. And we have to be persistent because these, these conditions are part of a failed economic system mm -hmm. that excludes people that are poor, whether they're black, white, whether they're in the South and North, whether they're in, on indigenous lands. I mean, it excludes them, it excludes them from the decision make, making process. And they're usually at the end of the line, if they're in the line at all, when it comes to, to getting access to those things that are needed for a better quality of life including clean air and clean water. Mm -hmm. And we have to change that. We have to change that. And I think that is a good way to, to say that part of the book is a charge to young people mm -hmm. to make sure that we can, can unpack the systems that have created these conditions because we can do better. Mm -hmm. And have you, you know, you met people who were working for other communities throughout the country who are in similar circumstances, um, facing env environmental injustices just like, or similar to those in Lowndes County. Have you guys formed any sort of working relationships where you were able to share best practices or is there any, I wanna leave viewers with a little bit of sense of hope. Um, <laughs> <laughs> are, are you guys talking about what's worked on the ground and like where, where the levers of power can be pushed most effectively? Well, actually we have, we have formed the Center for Rural Enterprise and Environmental Justice. And our goal is to be able to work with communities and collaborate with communities around the country with them being the ones driving it, not us. Mm -hmm. But what we can do is are the community organizers that helped us organize and collect information in Lyons County to pass on those techniques and practices to, uh, to those communities and help them to understand and have access to policymakers. And then our third goal is to also work on technology and partner with collaborators, hopefully people from NASA and places <laughs> like that, to, to come up with something that, that's earthly that we can use and, 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 and everybody would have access to because the wastewater problem is not just a Lowndes County problem or just a Southern problem. It's a national problem and it's also a global problem. And this is an opportunity for us to, to, to solve it. I'm very hopeful. I'm very hopeful because I have people reaching out to me from around the country that want to be a part of the solution. Mm -hmm. uh, people are reaching out from around the world and say, look, we got that same problem too. And let's We'll work together on finding something that works. So that's our effort now is to engage with young people mm -hmm. uh, at universities and hopefully eventually young people, you know, going back to my roots, young people in, in high school and middle school that want to work on the technology side, to work on the, the scientific side, to try to find something that works because we're going to need out of the box thinkers because the yeah. current paradigm does not work. And we also was key in all of this is learning how to engage with communities on the ground. Had it not been the fact that I listened to people in Lowndes County, I would not have written this book. I would not be, I would have not have received the MacArthur Award. It was because of the people on the ground who were living the situation, who told me what was going on and I listened to them. That, and, and I am very, very hopeful. That's how we find solutions. Yeah, I think I think that's the thing that that's the key message to me is that being able to listen to what people's experiences are and share them with others and and you took people to actually see what the um what the conditions were on the ground and I think that it, it was a lot of the power to to very clearly illustrate it to people who might be able to help you do something about it. Um, so, uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, the book is really, really, um, it's, it's quite optimistic, especially given what it's about and, and how, how scary and horrifying some of the scenes are. Well, thank you. Thank you for you know, for taking the time to read it and, and, and ask me these deep questions, because at the end of the day, I think that we have to, I want people uh, to, after they read the book, 
to, to be hopeful because what, whatever we do, we have to do it in a way that it can have a positive impact mm-hmm. on seven generations to come. And I believe we can do that. Thanks for listening to this week's Afterwatch podcast. Subscribe, rate, and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Send us an email at podcasts at c-span.org.